Finding it possible to understand, however, that God may answer prayers to those who pray for themselves, what are we to think concerning prayer for others? One may well say, it would surely be very selfish to pray only for ourselves. But the question is of the use, not of the character of the action. If there be any good in it, let us pray for all for whom we feel we can pray. But is there to be found in regard to prayer for others any such satisfaction as in regard to prayer for ourselves? The ground is changed if the fitness of answering prayer lies in the praying of him who prays. The attitude necessary to reception does not belong to those for whom prayer is made, but to him by whom it is made. What fitness, then, can there be in praying for others? Will God give to another for our asking what he would not give without it? Would he not, if it could be done without the person's self, do it without a second person? If God were a tyrant, one whose heart might be softened by the sight of anxious love, or if he were one who might be informed, enlightened, reasoned with, or one in whom a setting forth of character, need, or claim might awake interest, then would there be plain reason in prayer for another, which yet, however disinterested and loving, must be degrading as offered to one unworthy of prayer. But if we believe that God is the one unselfish, the one good being in the universe, and that his one design with his children is to make them perfect as he is perfect, if we believe that he not only would once give, but is always giving himself to us for our life, if we believe, which once I heard a bishop decline to acknowledge, that God does his best for every man, if also we believe that God knows every man's needs and will, for love's sake, not spare one pang that may serve to purify the soul of one of his children, if we believe all this, how can we think he will in any sort alter his way with one because another prays for him? The prayer would arise from nothing in the person prayed for. Why should it initiate a change in God's dealing with him? The argument I know not how to answer. I can only, in the face of it, and feeling all the difficulty, say and say again, Yet I believe I may pray for my friend, for my enemy, for anybody. Yet, and yet, there is, there must be, some genuine essential good and power in the prayer of one man for another to the maker of both, and that just because their maker is perfect, not less than very God. I shall not bring authority to bear. For authority can at best but make us believe reason there. It cannot make us see it. The difficulty remains the same, even when we hear the Lord himself pray to his Father for those the Father loves because they have received his Son, loves therefore with a special love, as the foremost in faith, the elect of the world, loves not merely because they must die if he did not love them, but loves them from the deeps of divine approval. Those who believe in Jesus will be satisfied, in the face of the incomprehensible, that in what he does reason and right must lie. But not therefore do we understand. At the same time, though I cannot explain, I can show some ground upon which, even had he not been taught to do so, but left alone with his heart, a man might yet, I think, pray for another. If God has made us to love like himself, and like himself long to help. If there are for whom we, like him, would give our lives to lift them from the evil gulf of their ungodliness, if the love in us would, for the very easing of the love he kindled, gift another, like himself who chooses and cherishes even the love that pains him, if in the midst of a sore need to bless, to give, to help, we are aware of an utter impotence. If the fire burns and cannot out, and if all our hope for ourselves lies in God, what is there for us? What can we think of? What do but go to God? What but go to him with this our own difficulty and need? And where is the natural refuge? There must be help. There can be no need for which he has no supply. The best argument that he has help is that we have need. If I can be helped through my friend, I think God will take the thing up and do what I cannot. Help my friend that I may be helped, perhaps help me to help him. You see, 
In praying for another, we pray for ourselves, for the relief of the needs of our love. It is not prayer for another alone, and thus it comes under the former kind. Would God give us love, the root of power in us, and leave that love whereby he himself creates, altogether helpless in us? May he not at least expedite something for our prayers? Where he could not alter, he could perhaps expedite, in view of some help we might then be able to give. If he desires that we should work with him, that work surely helps him. There are some things for which the very possibility of supposing them are an argument, but I think I can go a little farther here, and imagine at least the where, if not the how, the divine conditions in which the help for another in answer to prayer is born, the divine region in which its possibility must dwell. God is ever seeking to lift us up into the sharing of his divine nature. God's kings, such men namely, as with Jesus have borne witness to the truth, share his glory even on the throne of the Father. See the grandeur of the creative love of the holy. Nothing less will serve it than to have his children, through his and their suffering, share the throne of his glory. If such be the perfection of the infinite, should that perfection bring him under bonds and difficulties, and not rather set him freer to do the thing he would in the midst of opposing forces? If his glory be in giving himself, and we must share therein, giving ourselves, why should we not begin here and now? If he would have his children fellow workers with him, if he has desired and willed that not only by the help of his eternal Son, but by the help also of the children who through him have been born from above, other and still other children shall be brought to his knee, to his fireside, to the plenty of his house, why should he not have kept some margin of room wherein their prayers may work for those whom they have to help, who are of the same life as they? I cannot tell how, but may not those prayers in some way increase God's opportunity for working his best and highest will? Dealing with his children, the good ones may add to his power with the not yet good, add to his means of helping them. One way is clear. The prayer will react upon the mind that prays. Its light will grow, will shine the brighter, and draw and enlighten the more. But there must be more in the thing. Prayer, in its perfect idea, being a rising up into the will of the eternal, may not the help of the Father become one with the prayer of the child? And for the prayer of him he holds in his arms, go forth for him who wills not yet to be lifted to his embrace. To his bosom God himself cannot bring his children at once, and not at all except through his own suffering and theirs. But will not any good parent find some way of granting the prayer of the child who comes to him, saying, Papa, this is my brother's birthday. I have nothing to give him, and I do love him so. Could you give me something to give him, or give him something for me? Still, could not God have given the gift without the prayer? And why should the good of any one depend on the prayer of another? I can only answer with the return question. Why should my love be powerless to help another? But we must not tie God to our measures of time, or think he has forgotten that prayer even which, apparently unanswered, we have forgotten. Death is not an impervious wall. Through it, beyond it, go the prayers. It is possible we may have some to help in the next world because we have prayed for them in this. Will it not be a boon to them to have an old friend to their service? I but speculate and suggest. What I see and venture to say is this. If in God we live and move and have our being, if the very possibility of loving lies in this, that we exist in and by the live air of love, namely God himself, we must, in this very fact, be nearer to each other than by any bodily proximity or interchange of help. And if prayer is like a pulse that sets this atmosphere in motion, we must, then, by prayer, come closer to each other than are the parts of our body by their complex nerve telegraphy. Surely, in the eternal, hearts are never parted. Surely, through the eternal, a heart that loves and seeks the good of another must hold that other within reach. 
Surely the system of things would not be complete in relation to the best thing in it, love itself, if love had no help in prayer. If I love and cannot help, does not my heart move me to ask him to help who loves and can? Him without whom life would be to me nothing, without whom I should neither love nor care to pray. Will he answer, Child, do not trouble me. I am already doing all I can. If such answer came, who that loved would not be content to be nowhere in the matter? But how if the eternal, limitless love, the unspeakable, self-forgetting God-devotion, which demanding all gives all, should say, Child, I have been doing all I could, but now you are come, I shall be able to do more. Here is a corner for you, my little one. Push at this thing to get it out of the way. How if he should answer, Pray on, my child, I am hearing you. It goes through me in help to him. We are of one mind about it. I help, and you help. I shall have you all safe at home with me by and by. There is no fear. Only we must work and not lose heart. Go and let your light so shine before men that they may see your good things, and glorify me by knowing that I am light and no darkness. What then? Oh, that lovely picture by Michelangelo, with the young ones and the little ones come to help God to make Adam. 